My name is Karen Baldwin. I'm a certified nurse midwife. I've been that way for mm, 36 years. At the moment, I'm getting ready to retire from my job of the last eight years, where I've been the graduate coordinator of the nurse practitioner program at Mount St. Mary College in Newburgh, New York. Before that time, I taught at Rutgers while I was finishing up my doctorate. I do research on centering pregnancy, which is a model of group prenatal care created by Sharon Rising, who is a certified nurse midwife. I hope to do some adjunct work with either some universities or possibly get back involved with centering pregnancy because I was much more involved with it um, a few years ago, and especially when I was writing my, my dissertation. I was a practicing nurse midwife and administrator in New York City for over 25 years. And I tell people that I took care of the richest women and the poorest women in New York City and everybody in between because I worked at many, many different kinds of sites from North Central Bronx and Jacoby in the middle of the crazy Bronx to Lenox Hill in private practice to Beth Israel in private practice and then at Bellevue um, taking care of women who came off the street as crack addicts who had no prenatal care or who had just gotten off the plane from China the day before and we're in labor. So I feel very fortunate to have gotten a really unbelievable experience um, taking care of, oh God, tens of thousands of women in New York City and delivering over 2,000 of them. So it's been a trip. It's been a real trip. I was actually talking to four new Penn graduates today and one of the things that they said to me was, what would you tell us? What would you tell us about all of your experiences and what what's the best pearl of wisdom that you could give to us and I said don't stay anywhere where you're not supported I've quit jobs in New York City when people were terrible to me when I felt that and this was as a staff midwife or as the director of the service with usually chief of OBGYNs who were not supportive of midwives and midwifery care and they were telling me horrible stories about what things that they're going through right now and how two of them just quit jobs because they were being treated in very terrible ways. And I thought, wow. They said, you know, nobody really talked to us about this in school. I said, well, I sure talked to my NP students about this. So that was really very interesting to see that it's still happening. When you think you've made so many inroads with people like Sharon Rising and Lonnie Morris and a lot of the other people that you've, that you've interviewed, we think we've made a lot of inroads and yet history does tend to repeat itself and the reason that I became a midwife is because I felt that women could not get the care that I thought they should get and didn't understand along the way that many many obstetricians are really misogynist and it's really still pretty prevalent in OBGYNs not just even with males but with females so that was a very interesting discussion to have with the students today. I was surprised and shocked that some of this stuff is sometimes even worse than some of the things that, that happened to us. I won't mention the hospital, but it's a very fancy hospital on the Upper East Side of New York. You can probably guess which one it is. And I only spent four short, long or short months there, depending on your perspective. And the reason I left is because the chief of OB, who was a very famous physician, called me into his office once and called me a brazen hussy to my face. And I thought, hmm, gee, I don't think I fit here. The reason he called me a brazen hussy is because we'd established a private practice at this particular hospital, and we were told that we had independent practice and total practice of our private patients. And one of the first patients that I delivered there was an Orthodox Hasidic woman who specifically came to the practice because she only wanted midwives or females to touch her. And after a very long, arduous labor at which she had an eight pound, six ounce, very healthy baby boy, the next morning after I'd stayed all night and got up the next morning to do postpartum rounds, I found the chief resident in her, in her room trying to examine her. And the patient was crazy, you know, trying to tell him, where's Karen, where's Karen, she's my midwife, you can't touch me. I walked into all of this and he started to yell and scream at me. 
I took him aside in the in the call call room and I said this is this is not good this is not what my arrangement is with Dr. So and so you can't do this and he said oh yes I can do this I'm the chief resident I can do anything I want to and I said I don't care and I walked into the chief the chief of OB and that's when he called me a brazen hussy so I thought okay <laughs> so I didn't last long in that private practice <laughs> But I have gone to other places where I've been so totally supported and my midwives have been totally supported. I think the best job that I had was at New York Beth Israel Medical Center where I was at for 10 years. It's on the Lower East Side of New York on First Avenue and 14th Street. I'm sure if you went to NYU, you know where it is. And I went there and we only had three midwives. Unfortunately, I had to fire two for a variety of reasons. But when I left there 13 years ago, there were 14 midwives there. And what I had done is establish not only a clinic service, which had, which had already been going, a private practice where we had two offices, and then we had five other offices in community clinics in the Lower East Side and on the Upper East Side. And those offices are still going. And I feel very proud and happy about the fact that women in all of those areas are receiving midwifery care even to this day so I feel like that was really a great accomplishment but I couldn't have done it without the support of the administration and the physician who was the chief of OBGYN we still talk I don't talk to him as much as I used to but he was he and the staff and the president of the hospital who knew me, knew me by name were very supportive of the, the things that I wanted to do. A funny story though, I was raised Protestant and married a Catholic and I did not know anything about Orthodox Jewish women at all. I say I became half Jewish working at Beth Israel Medical Center because the president of the hospital and the chief of OBGYN called me in one day and said, Karen, the women in Williamsburg, the Orthodox women, want you to come and go to ODA, which is a clinic in Williamsburg, and start seeing patients there. There are two male physicians there, and they're uncomfortable with them, and they heard about the midwives at Beth Israel, which is where they want to deliver, because it's convenient for them, and they'd like midwives there. I said, oh God, what a great opportunity this is. So the rabbi, who was the CEO of this particular institution, and I and the president of the hospital and the chief of OBGYN and I had a meeting. Well, I made a big mistake. I put my hand out. I didn't know that he wasn't going to touch me or shake my hand. Well, the meeting didn't go very well. And the women were still complaining that we weren't there. And finally, the president of the hospital told the rabbi to get over it. So we had another meeting. I apologized. This rabbi and I became best friends, okay, after the 10 years that I was there. And we created a huge, huge clinic for these Orthodox women. And the midwives at Beth Israel are still going there. And it's, it's a very successful, successful program. But, funny story, right? <laughs> <laughs> I learned a lot that I didn't know. Oh, well. I didn't know whether I should tell this story or not, but when I was talking to the new graduates from Penn today, one of them was telling me a story about a delivery that she did probably about eight or nine months ago at a hospital in Brooklyn where a phys physician came in and interrupted her delivery and basically abused her verbally and abused the patient. And she never talked to anybody about it and I was trying to get her to talk to me about it a little bit, but it brought back a story that happened to me at my very first job at Cumberland Hospital in Brooklyn, which doesn't exist anymore. Cumberland and Greenpoint Hospitals, which were both Health and Hospitals Corporation hospitals in Brooklyn, became Woodhall. So my very first job as a midwife was in 1979 at Cumberland Hospital, which is a city hospital right the first stop off the D train in Brooklyn and we used to work nights there most of the time and we saw patients on Mosher Street in Brooklyn with a big MIC family planning project 
We were to deliver the patients at Cumberland, but some of the patients at Mosher Street said they wanted to deliver at Brooklyn Hospital. Well, the chief of OBGYN at Brooklyn Hospital wouldn't let us deliver there. Only, we could only deliver at the city hospital. But we were allowed to do postpartum rounds on the, our patients. Sort of a very strange setup. So I lasted there for two years, and again, a story about support and craziness that went on that made me leave there. One night, it's, and it would be 12 hour nights, but it would be 14, 15 hours. I lived in Teaneck, I had two little kids. It was a very long commute, because I'd have to take public transportation. So one night I'm on, and there were Korean residents, mostly Korean residents at Cumberland Hospital at that time, and they didn't speak very good English. Um, and for most of the time, they left us alone. But one night, a prima gravita, a person having her first baby, came in, and she didn't speak very, very much English. And she was having what we used to call in those days an attack A. She was in pretty whopping good labor, and she was going, ah, 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 ah. And the Korean resident was driving him crazy. She was my patient. I was doing fine with her. It was no big deal to me. I didn't care what she did. He came in and he told her to be quiet. And she didn't know what he was saying to her. He didn't speak any Spanish. She didn't speak Korean. She couldn't understand him. I'm at her bedside. I'm holding her hand. And he kept telling her to shut up. And I kept saying to her, it's OK. It's OK. You know, you don't have to stay here. Well, finally, he moved in. And she did it once more. And he slugged her. He went whop, just like that. Well, I didn't know what to do. And I just kind of looked at him, and I stayed with the patient for a while. She was okay, and um, I think we got her some medication after that. And I thought, I can't stay here. I'm really, I'm really afraid. I wasn't afraid so much for myself, but I was really afraid of what he, what he was going to do for the patient. But at the same time, I thought this is a really scary situation. What am I going to do? My first job, I'm a young midwife. I called my chief midwife at home. This is in the middle of the night. She lived in Queens. It must have been about 1 or 2 in the, in the morning. I said, Sandy, what am I supposed to do? I'm really scared. I told her she knew who the people were. She, she said, get the hell out of there. I don't care what you have to say to them. You are not to stay there. You tell them that your kids are sick. You tell them you are sick. She said, can you ne no negotiate the transportation system and get yourself back to New Jersey now? And I said, yes, I think I can. So I called up my husband. I said, I'm coming home. And he said, are you going to be OK? And I said, yes, I'm, I think I'm going to be OK. Well, in the next couple of days, my chief midwife told the chief doctor, and nothing happened to this physician. So it was another instance of not only abuse of patients, but just total lack of respect for the patient and me. And I just said, I can't. And yet, like I said about Beth Israel, I mean, there were times when there were issues. But for the most part, everybody wanted to make this happen. And they gave me full authority to do my job. And when you're supported, you can make things happen. You can make really good things happen. When you're not, get out. And that was my message to the students today, and they got it. A couple of them who had been in really bad situations said, I know what you're saying, and we, are, we got out. And yet two of the other ones said they had great jobs. One has a job in Maine someplace, in Portland. Another one has a job in a birthing center in Arizona, and they said really different, you know, concepts. So what do I think is good and what do I think is bad? Well, I think the best thing I ever did was going to Beth Israel and, and being able to establish all these different kinds of services for women. Probably my biggest regret was leaving Beth Israel. Um, unfortunately, I'm an impatient person. I get bored easily. This is after 10 years, OK? I wanted to start a birthing center there, but there was no room. It's New York City, and every single space in that hospital is taken up by something. Even though they sent me away to a birthing center conference, they really liked the idea, there was no place to put this. So I said to myself, you know, I've probably done as much as I can in this particular service, and I was kind of looking around to see maybe there was something else. And I got seduced. 
okay? I got seduced by NYU and Bellevue's Birthing Center, which unfortunately closed two years ago in August. I wanted to be the director of the midwifery service there. Now, I didn't learn the first, I had been the director of the Gouverneur Birthing Center before I went to Beth Israel. So I didn't learn the first time that there were incredible amounts of issues there. The biggest issue at Gouverneur Bellevue, NYU, is that you never know who your boss is. You got three bosses. You got NYU because you're an NYU affiliation employee. You deliver babies at Bellevue and you're seeing patients at Gouverneur. It was a nightmare. I went to the birthing center. I had some really strange midwives there that unfortunately the leadership had not been well done and I had a lot of problems with them and I tried to talk to the director of OBGYN about it and he didn't want to talk to me. You're too much trouble, okay? You're too much trouble. Um, I thought you were going to be able to come in here and just solve all these problems and I said I can't solve the problems unless you're going to help me. I should have known better. I should have run out of there kicking and screaming on my first day in the birthing center but I said no, I gotta stay. So this is what happened. I started there the day after Lincoln's birthday because NYU had Lincoln's birthday as a holiday. So I said, is it okay if I go there and just set up my office on Lincoln's birthday? They said, yeah, fine. You're not gonna get paid for that day, but you can go in. I said, fine, I'm gonna go in. I'm gonna go to the birthing center. I'm gonna see what's going on. I'm gonna take my books with me. I'm gonna set up my office. Birthing center was closed that day because there were no women there. There were no patients in labor. So I walk in, I'm setting up my office, and the lights are off in the birthing center, and I went down to the nurse's station, and I flipped the lights on, and I noticed that there's a chart there. I said, oh, well, maybe I should look at this chart to kind of see what's going on here in the birthing center. Opened up the chart, started reading it, and I thought I was going to pass out from what I saw on the chart. The midwives, the night before, had had a patient, a prima gravida again, somebody they're having their first baby, who was admitted to the birthing center at one or two centimeters. They put her in the tub. She seemed to be progressing. She was having a lot of pain. They gave her some Demerol and Phenergan. They kept her for 18 hours in the birthing center. She progressed to five centimeters stopped having contractions, and they sent her home. Failing to understand that this woman had an arrest of labor at five centimeters, and this was a, what I felt a very dangerous situation. I called up one of the perinatologists who, I, who was on staff at NYU who I'd known at Beth Israel, a, a guy I really trusted. I said, Andre, what the hell am I supposed to do about this? He said, you get that patient back in here as soon as possible. Oh, my God. Got the patient back in there, called the midwives, asked them, what were you thinking? Oh, well, you know, she stopped labor. You know, we just thought she'd be better at home. We told her to come back when she got more active. This is now 18, 24 hours later. Got her back in. Well, guess what? Had chorioamnionitis, meaning she had an infection. Okay. She was sectioned. Baby wasn't doing so well, okay? Like I said, should have left right then and there, okay? And <laughs> just said, I can't take this anymore. <laughs> Got no support for, you know, trying to talk to the midwives about this. Just leave me alone. Just don't talk to me. This is what the chief of OB said. It only got worse, okay, over the next, I'd say, nine or ten months. So then on a July 4th weekend, the birthing center was closed. I'm the director of the birthing center, but nobody told me. The nurses at Bellevue decided they were going to close the birthing center because they didn't have enough staff. But they didn't tell us, and then all of our midwifery patients who were eligible had to go over to labor and delivery and be seen by the residents. Well, that wasn't such a great scene. I was supposed to be called and told I could have maybe figured something out about how to staff the birthing center, but I didn't know. I go in on whatever the next day was, find out that the birthing center was closed, went smack dab right into the chief of OB for, at NYU's uh, office to complain about this, and he goes, 
oh, that's really terrible, that's awful, oh, they can't do that. He said, I want you to write a letter. He gave me five people to write a letter to, um, the chief nurse, the nursing manager. He told me what to say in the letter, which I did. I hand delivered the letters to each of the offices of these people. The next morning, he starts calling me on my cell phone to tell me how dare I do this. I said, what? I said, you told me to do this. No, I didn't. I said, oh, yes, you did. He said, I want you to go back and get every one of those letters back and retrieve them because it's causing too much trouble and you're too much trouble for me. I said, okay, so-and-so. I'll do that. I did that and I knew that it was only going to be straight downhill because I had no support from him. Now mind you, the birthing center is closed. Now, it's been many years later, but it's, it's the problem of all of this very convoluted, complicated relationships that NYU has with Bellevue, okay, that they can't seem to work out a lot of these issues. Somebody told me a very interesting thing. The person who is now the director of the Bellevue Midwifery Service told me that the new chief of OBGYN has nine or ten kids. Most of them have del been delivered by nurse midwives. This is a time that this service is finally, it's giving me chills, is going to flourish because once again, support. Support to do your job and take care of women the way that midwives know how to take care of them. It's in leadership positions and, and who's in them. And if midwives do not have the support to be able to do the things that they can do, and I'm sure you've heard this. This may be a theme that you're hearing, um, but certainly something that, that I have found in, in my positions. Finally, what happened at NYU a few months later is that it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. Midwives were acting out. They weren't. They were doing things that were not safe. I tried to talk to him and his colleagues. No one would listen to me. One day, I walked in. It was in January. I walked in, and he had all of these guys surrounding him. And one of them came up to me and handed me a letter. I said, "What is this all about?" He said, "Go read it." I read it, and it was all filled with lies about things that I had never done, that I had never said, situations that were only half told in the letter, and I said, that's it. I can't do this. I can't stay here. I walked back in, and I said I quit. Oh, are you sure? Are you sure? I said, yes, I can't work like this. I cannot work with people that do not support me, and you guys obviously do not support me or the midwifery service or what I did. I said, I had 10 years of very great success at Beth Israel, and I come here, and in less than a year, you have totally decimated anything that I ever wanted to do. I said, I quit and left. I left his office. I walked down to HR at NYU. I took the letter with me, and I said to the head of HR, I said, have you seen this letter? He goes, no, but I heard something about it. I said, okay, Ivan, read the letter. He read the letter very carefully, very stern-faced, looked up at me and said, he said, did you quit? I said, yeah, I quit. He said, yeah, I understand that. He said, will you stay a couple more months? And I said, I really don't want to. He said, stay a couple more months so that we can kind of tie some of this stuff together. I said, I'll think about it. I said, I'm going to go home and talk to my husband about this. So I went home and talked to my husband about it. Ivan called me in the next day and he said, he looked at me and he said, what do you want? I, I had no idea where this guy was going with this conversation. I don't know whether it was naivete. I didn't know. I said, Ivan, I don't, I don't know what you mean. What do you mean, what do you want? He goes, how much severance do you want? Then I knew exactly what he wanted, needed. They, they wanted me to shut up so that I wouldn't sue them. I said, I'd like a year. He said, you've only been here a year. I said, how about six months of salary? I was making a very good salary. Six months of salary and six months of benefits. He goes, sounds very reasonable to me. And I left. It was the worst job I've ever had. It was terrible. And I regret, I, I got seduced by the birthing center. 
And because I thought that this was really an opportunity for me to do something different and something that was really going to be great. That birthing center had been given money to start by Ruth Messenger, who was a, the city council president a long, long time ago. And it seemed like a great city thing to do. There was only one birthing center at, MC, at maternity center at that time that doesn't even exist anymore, out of hospital birthing center. And I thought, this is for city hospital patients, for Chinese patients, Hispanic patients, what a wonderful thing we can do. And yet, there was never any support to do so. So that actually was my last clinical job. And that led me to Sharon Rising. I was a finishing doctoral student at Teachers College at Columbia in health education, and I was looking around for a dissertation topic. The department of OBGYN at NYU had promised me that I could do my dissertation in the birthing center, but since I was no longer there, that wasn't going to happen. So I started reading the midwifery journals, and I had been an ASPO certified Lamaze instructor for many, many years, and, and read an article that Sharon had written on centering pregnancy, and I thought, oh, wow, this is really cool. This is a wonderful idea. I love this. Called Sharon up. She said, yeah, come down. Come on up to Waterbury, Connecticut. So I spent two or three years hanging out with Sharon and loved what she was doing and did a, then a huge quantitative research project for my dissertation looking at three sites around the country and comparing the results of centering pregnancy to traditional care on several different aspects of care. And I think the biggest thing that I found out was that the knowledge of the patients in centering was so much greater, was statistically significant to the ones in traditional care. So that's kind of started out the whole kind of research stuff. I mean, I'm a, I'm a single researcher. I'm not the big Yale team that Sharon's hooked up with. So I published that article in the journal, and it's been quoted many, many times. And I actually get about, I'd say, five to eight requests from around the world um, every year for people wanting my tools from that particular um, study, you know, asking me a question about something about the study. So that, that's really fun. I really like that. So I'd I think I'd like to get more involved in centering. I've talked to Sharon about that. Um, things have really exploded. That ho the whole centering pregnancy thing has just gone wild. And it's a wonderful thing. The biggest issue that they're dealing with right now is, is Medicaid reimbursement on the state level. And um, who knows, maybe I can be of help in New York State for that. So. That would, be, that would be a really fun thing to do. I mean, at Beth Israel, what was really nice is from the moment I walked in onto the labor floor, there was never any question about how the midwives would manage patients. And, and that had gone on before me because the person that had been the midwifery director there was a little tiny Indian woman named Coco Roy who had been there for many, 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 many years. And she was able to establish safe midwifery where we didn't have to start IVs on patients if they didn't need them. They could drink and labor. They could have intermittent monitoring. They could walk around the hospital. They could go in the shower. We didn't have tubs because there wasn't any room for a friggin' tub any place. Um, when, even when we did, we did the labor rooms, they were maybe 9 by 12 at the, at the biggest um, because we were in the middle of an inner city and there just wasn't any room to put anybody else there. I mean, even at NCB, I used to say to the midwives, it doesn't matter what the room is like, it matters how you, how you, how you treat the patients. And once they realized that, it, the accoutrement, it was not important. You can make your own stuff, you know, you can make people happy with different stuff. So, I became a midwife because when I became pregnant with my first child 43 years ago, um, I could not receive the kind of prenatal care that I wanted. I, uh, there were no midwives, there were obstetricians. But the big deal was, 43 years ago in Toledo, Ohio, my husband was not allowed to be in the delivery room with me, even though I was a traditionally, very traditionally trained Lamaze mother. Okay? They don't even have these kind of courses around anymore. I went into labor, it went very fast. And he was with me during the whole labor and then got shut out <clears throat> of the delivery room. It was so stupid. 
I had to change doctors in the middle of my second pregnancy three years later because my first obstetrician still would not allow fathers in the delivery room. In the middle of the pregnancy, he changed his mind. Why? Because he was losing patients. So now, if a father doesn't go in the delivery room, we think something's wrong with them. So again, I helped get fathers in the delivery room at Toledo Hospital. So, and that's why I became a midwife, because I didn't want it, this to happen to anybody. Women need to be supported in labor. They need whomever they want to be with them. At Beth Israel, one time we had a lady in labor, and one of my midwives came up to me and said, i got a really strange situation going on here. I don't know what to do about this. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, Mrs. So-and-so is in labor, but there's two guys out there. They both said they're, they're her husband. I went, okay, what's going on here? So we figured out she was getting a divorce. The father of the baby was the person she was divorcing, but it was not the person she wanted in labor. So we had to kind of straighten this whole thing out. I think we kind of appeased everybody, but it was a very strange situation. <laughs> Part of midwifery is how we treat patients, how we are with women. It's very, very different than how most obstetricians are or most physicians are because they're trained on the medical model. And since nurse midwives are trained as nurses, and I, and I believe that lay, lay midwives or CPMs or whatever they're calling themselves also have a holistic approach to patients. And they're not just interested in how the contractions are right now, they're interested in Who's going to be with you? And you got kids at home? Who's babysitting for them? And what's going on? And when you leave the hospital, do you have enough diapers and baby clothes to take care of your baby? And are you going to be able to come for your six-week checkup? And all of that. It's, it's a matter of, of, of support. It's exactly what Centering Pregnancy is about in a nutshell, which is being with women and being, being able to support them.